All right, so I don't have a crystal ball, but if there is anything that we should acknowledge about the future is that it's nothing certain, that uh, the world is ever changing, our industry is ever changing, and we are ever changing. And that means that there is no one size fits all model to game development. There are no two games that are made that are made identically, that are made in the exact same way. Because even if you have this exact same team with the exact same genre, with the exact same timeline and budget, we ourselves change. And, oh, this is interesting. That also means that we can't have every discipline that we need uh, to develop, to sell, and to keep selling games in-house, because it's just not feasible. Now I do. Uh, it's just the, the green one. All right, thank you. So that means that if we can't have every discipline in-house, that we will need to work with external partners to be able to create games in a healthy, sustainable, diverse, and profitable way. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Quick overview. Um, first, we're going to talk about, uh, I'll do a quick overview of the key takeaways. If I want you to take anything away from this session, that would be it. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about where I'm even coming from, why I'm talking about this, uh, before we move into defining who your studio is, who your team is, and who you are, because that's the basis where it all starts from. You need to know who you are before you can determine who you're not before you can determine what the parts are that you can do externally. And then I'm going to ask you to reframe your thinking because thinking about all the things that you can't do can be a little demotivating. So I'm going to ask you to reframe your thinking. Think about these challenges, these things that you can't do in-house as an opportunity, an opportunity to learn and to grow. And then I'm going to run you through several case studies uh, of situations where I've applied this thinking myself uh, and that have basically put me here on stage talking about it, after which we'll have some room for questions. So with regards to the key takeaways, um, if there is something that I believe on a personal level, on a team level, on a studio level that is critical to do, is to define what your vision is, what your goals are, uh, and from there, figure out what it is that makes you unique. Figure out what it is that is your leverage, that helps you prioritize what basically drives the bang for your buck that you and your studio can make. From there, you can go to the flip side and acknowledge your challenges. What are the parts that you can't or should do in-house? And when you have those, think about the opportunities that you have. There are a lot of opportunities in these challenges. You can, for example, capitalize on your in-house talent. Make sure that they are doing what they're, what they're best at what they want to learn, where they want to grow, instead of focusing on the things that maybe you should be leaving to someone else. And if you do have to leave something to someone else, work with external partners to do that. There are a lot of partners that can do something more effectively, more efficiently, at a lower budget than you can do it in-house. And once you are building up those relationships with those partners, there are a lot of long-term benefits to be reaped. You can save cost, you can mitigate risk, and you can honestly gain a lot by talking to people from different cultures. So where am I coming from? Why should you attach any value at all to what I'm saying? So I am a programmer by degree, a producer by trade, uh, and an organizational nut by nature. And that has resulted in my uh, starting my career as a publishing producer at a very small indie company indie publisher called Sodesco. Uh, at this company, I published over 50 titles on PC and uh, console, uh, digital and retail, worldwide releases. Uh, they were with independent developers from all over the world. And while I was there, I built a publishing pipeline where we also included uh, QA, localization, uh, getting age ratings, and eventually moved on to also getting some outsourcing done, getting ports done, et cetera. So I've been working with external partners since I joined the industry back in 2015. Uh, from there, I moved on to Paradox. That's where I had my overlap with Linda, the previous speaker. Um, and at Paradox, one of my biggest projects was to uh, be the publishing producer and product manager for the Shadowrun trilogy port from PC to console, for which I worked with multiple partners, including one who's in the audience at the moment. Um, 
And uh, yeah, we worked oh, at my, during my time there, we worked with a lot of different independent development teams as well. I have since moved on to being a development director of external development at Electronic Arts. So again, heavy focus on working with, with partners from different companies from all over the world. And in addition to that, as, as both Linda and Nijo um, hinted at, I am the founder and director of the Game Production Community Discord server. Um, the server is a community of over 4,000 production and project management and folks in leadership position, uh, professionals from the game industry, people from all over the world, all seniority levels, where we talk about uh, anything and everything that can help us learn, uh, develop, and grow and in our roles and becoming better uh, support for our teams. And with that, we're going to talk about much more interesting things than me, which is you. Um, one thing that I've found for myself is that I've found it incredibly valuable to define my own values, uh, and that's, that's, that inspires this. So you as a studio, or as a team, or as an individual, probably have a dream. And given that you're here at India GDC, probably means that that dream involves running a healthy, sustainable, profitable studio or team, that you want to develop great games delivering fantastic player experiences. You have a vision that is unique to you. You have values that can help drive you uh, in that vision on delivering. You have goals to set. Um, if you don't, you can get started with that. So what, one thing that I would recommend in that sense is every studio, every team is unique. So there is no cookie cutter way to um, how to define the vision for your studio or for your team. But you can start, for example, by looking at your staffing plan. You can start to look at what are the disciplines that I have in-house? What could they uniquely deliver? Um, also, what are their interests? What are their desires? Where do they want to grow and, and, uh, and improve? And then from there, uh, figure out what capacity they have. What are they capable of with the time that they have? Because they can't work infinitely, even if they are fantastic. Um, so you have to start thinking about what is your leverage? What is that thing that you and your team and your studio can uniquely do that brings you the highest ROI? For another recommendation on this, I can also recommend Sophie Vo's uh, free Rise and Play Masterclass, which is available online. It can help you set your studio's vision, team, et cetera. It could also easily be applied on a team level as well. And with that comes the counter side. Uh, because the reality is that you and your team cannot possibly do everything. And as I mentioned as I was opening up, this industry is ever-changing. Our world is ever-changing. We are ever-changing. And because of that, as I said, you can't have everything in-house. Um, you are going to have needs that you, quite frankly, shouldn't try to do in-house because you can't offer career development, HR overhead, and continuity to every discipline. There are disciplines that you don't need full time throughout the entirety of the cycle. So at this point, you know what your vision is, you know what your unique leverage is. What are the parts that you don't necessarily need to do in-house? What are the parts that you can work with an external partner for? And one of the other things that's very important to keep in mind here is that even if you have the people in-house that have the knowledge to do something, that doesn't mean that it's effective or efficient or really saves you or, or has, um, is cost effective to be able to do that in-house. You don't necessarily have enough programmers to do all the programming work that needs to get done. So at this point, give shape to that. Start making uh, an overview of the things that, that you don't need to do in-house. And once you have that image of this is, this is who we are, this is our leverage, these are our priorities, and these are the things that we don't need to do in-house, make sure that you challenge that perspective. Because you probably have a background in one discipline, two disciplines, but you don't know every discipline out there. So take that picture to your team and ask them, challenge me on this. Am I right in making these assumptions that this is where our strengths are and this is our points of improvement, this, these are the parts that we should do externally. And if you're comfortable enough with that, you can also challenge yourself by talking to other founders, other producers, team leads, 
that can help you determine what it is that other teams uh, um, see as their vision, mission, and goals, as their leverage, and see how that can complement yours or contradict yours. And that is that point. Like at this point, you've put together a list of a very motiv uh, motivating list of what you can do, but also a list of the stuff that you can't do in-house or shouldn't. And that can be a little, a little painful. But I want to challenge you to, to reframe your thinking. That is not a failure. That is an opportunity. And that opportunity that you can look for comes in a, in a, a few different um, flavors. So one of them is that you can capitalize on your in-house talent, especially in smaller teams. People are often wearing multiple hats. And that doesn't mean that all of those hats fit them equally well. So there are things that they are probably doing that don't fit them perfectly, um, that are best done by someone else. So a very, uh, a very practical example is that sometimes you have a programmer that might also know German, and you've talked to publishers, so you know that getting your tr game translated can increase your sales. Does that mean that you should let your German programmer translate the game? No. Because not only is that not going to be a great translation, it's also not going to be the thing that they want to be doing, and it's not the thing where you can get the most, most benefit out of what their work is. If you let them code, you're probably going to generate more revenue from that as long as you get someone else to do that translation. So beyond that, uh, when it comes to uh, capitalizing on, on in-house talent, um, your designer might be doing some QA. Well, let me tell you, there are QA companies out there that are a lot better at creating bug reports than our designers ever will be. So that is another one of those examples where you need to let the talent that you have do what they are best at. So when you have determined that, uh, the stuff that you want to do in-house and then uh, look for, for external partners for, there are a lot of benefits to that. When you collaborate with external partners, you can scale very temporarily. So you can scale for uh, just the duration of a few months. You can also scale highly specifically. You can uh, hire that one person that you only need for 10 hours a week for uh, three weeks at a time, and you can have that very precise discipline that not, you don't need for the entirety of your project either, uh, saving you, as mentioned, the HR overhead, uh, the um, career development that you would otherwise have to do, and the continuity that you would have to offer them. And in some locales, uh, skip the, the permanent contract you might have to offer them. Um, you can also scale just in time. So there are deadlines that come up, and they come up a lot faster than we tend to want. Um, and there are a lot of benefits to being able to deliver on that deadline. And that means that you can uh, hire an external partner to make sure that you meet that deadline and reap those benefits specifically. You can also, and, and you guys here in India probably know this better than anyone else, is that if you work with external partners, you may be able to do so more affordably than if you have to scale in-house. And in my case, I'm, I'm from the Netherlands. We are not the most expensive geography out there, but there are times where I can hire multiple people from India or from Brazil that would otherwise only afford me one person in the Netherlands. And that is one of your opportunities, right? That is one of the opportunities that you have um, being based out of India. You can also parallelize work, and this one is a little harder to grasp, but there are a lot of benefits to being able to release earlier than, rather than later. So you probably have uh, a marketing trajectory where you've already started building up uh, buzz. Um, if you have to delay that, you're not just running uh, the risk of having to insert more marketing budget, but you also lose your buzz. There are also parts where your community will st stop trusting the promises that you're making. Um, and in addition to that, money that you get back in the bank earlier has a lot of compound benefits over time. So being able to make your release earlier rather than later allows you to start reinvesting the money that you're generating earlier as well. So you can start to parallelize work to make sure that stuff gets done. So even if you have the person that's capable of doing everything full time in five months, you may be able to generate a larger return on investment by parallelizing that over two tracks. 
And then lastly, um, you can also maximize that external expertise. So the same thing that you would be doing with when you're capitalizing on your in-house talent, you can also do with your external talent. Those are people that are becoming experts in what you do often, more of an expert in the stuff that you're working on than you are. And they have a lot of diverse skills. They are currently applying that for you in one very specific field, but you can probably let them do a lot more with that. Now, I get that question. We don't have the money to buy, to, to get uh, um, these, these services externally. You might be cash flow challenged, but you can get creative around that as well because there's a good chance that you're currently doing work in-house that can be done more affordably externally, more efficiently or more effectively externally. Um, you're probably also always spending money somewhere that you don't need to. Uh, and while I am a very strong advocate for paying for work that is being done, there are ways to work with people in a way that is financially beneficial to all of you. So there are situations, and this needs to be carefully negotiated, where you can work with royalties or you can work with paying someone a sum on or after release. It doesn't always have to be then and there. Again, very highly dependent on the individual and your situation as a company, but it is something to consider. And one that I don't see done enough, um, and one of my case studies touches on this, is that there's also a good chance that you have someone in-house that you don't need for full-time for the entirety of your project, and that you have a need for a different discipline that you don't have in-house. And that means you can be of benefit to each other. You're not competitors. We're all trying to make great games. So, Say you need a UI engineer for a month uh, and your partner team that's down the street needs a concept artist for two. Maybe there's a way that you can be of use to each other. So again, before I move on to my case studies, uh, I want to emphasize that just because you have challenges and needs, that doesn't mean that's a failure of your team. It's natural to have needs that you can't meet in-house. And the opportunity here is to start building new partnerships, to start building uh, relationships with teams outside of your own uh, that you can then turn into long-term partnerships to mitigate risk and save costs uh, and, and turn that into long-term benefits. Um, there are so many ways that you can leverage external expertise and skill and availability um, and also just a different perspective from your own. That brings me to my case studies. So I'm going to run through these examples uh, of different ways to leverage external partners uh, across three different case studies. Um, and I'm touching on these uh, from my personal experience, not just because they were pleasantly surprising, but because they motivated me to come up here and talk about it. They are why I advocate for working with external partners to begin with. So in this case, um, it was, uh, I was a consultant uh, for a, as a producer for a title called Lost Words. Uh, my background is as a publishing producer. I had personally never been a development producer other than for uh, a few porting projects, which were honestly quite waterfall to begin with. So at this stage, this company had a production vacancy. Uh, it was not one that I was going to apply to because I was just joining a Paradox at the time. But I had some time on my hands, and they were, were very squeezed for getting someone to support them on the production side. And I told them, like, I don't have the development production chops that you need, but I know that you are working with a publisher, and I know that you will have questions about what it is to work with a publisher in general. And I know that there are probably some basics about production that I do know that I can help you with. Um, there are some basics about QA and about getting a port and about talking to publishers that I can support with. So in this case, what I did was uh, I spent several hours a week just on the phone with the founder, with their QA guy who wanted to be a development producer, talking about what it is um, that could make them fill that gap, that production gap, for a while uh, until they actually landed uh, the person that they, they wanted to have longer term. Um, and for me, I, I could do this uh, because I knew I had a job lined up because 
I frankly wanted a little bit of experience at, on the development side. I wanted to get close to a development team. So for me, I didn't need something else from this. The learning that I was getting to get close to this team, that was the benefit for me. It wasn't free work because I was getting something in return. Um, of course, there are many situations where you would just have to pay someone. I actually got value from it myself. But the kind of team that you could, or, or individuals, the kind of external expertise that you can pull in for that, this as examples are freelancers or consultants. So these are situations where you need someone just for a little while until you find the right person or you find the right partner to work with. And you can do that very specifically. So in my case, it was support on the production side. Um, that was only needed for a couple hours a week. Um, and that could be a UI engineer, that could be a concept artist, it could be anyone. Case study number two uh, is about scaling just in time and affordably. So Garage Studio 27 Studios is my 911 studio. My 112, I think here it's 110. Anyway, the, your emergency number. Um, Whenever I'm stuck in a tight spot, I know that I can reach out to this team and they will be there for me. And it, the ask can be incredibly small, it can also be incredibly big. Because I don't know what it is about Brazilian teams, but they are there to work together with you to find a solution. And in this case, this relationship started very small. The very first thing that they helped me out with was uh, I believe supporting me with a patch where we had some turnover on the programming side, but this patch needed to get out the door. From there, they supported us on other titles, like with concept art or with optimization for a switch port. And eventually, though it started with four-figure deals, it led to us signing a six-figure deal with them one or two years down the road. So it is something where you can build up that relationship by making use of those initial engagements, those smaller engagements to start learning about what are each other's communication styles, what uh, is your working charter, like that sort of thing. And that this is one of those examples where when I'm stuck in a tight spot, I have partners that I can rely on. Uh, and in this case also, because they are based out of Brazil, that meant that with them I could hire several people which would otherwise have only resorted, resulted in one resource from the Netherlands. Uh, options that you can consider for these kinds of needs are partner development teams that you're close to. They don't have to be your competitors. Again, it could just be the company that's sitting right next to you or before and in front of you, uh, in front of or behind you right now. And then the third case study, and probably my favorite, and the one for whom I'm looking at a few specific people in the audience right now, um, is the Shadowrun Trilogy port that we did at Paradox from PC to console. Um, in this case, we worked with three different external partners for the same project. So our development team was based out of the Netherlands. It was a mixed culture team um, of roughly five to ten people. Uh, we worked with a game user research company from France. And then also, the company that I'm going to be talking about today is Godspeed Games, uh, a QA company based out of Pune here in India, um, who was onboarded for our QA. So as I joined Paradox, uh, I, the, the project was already underway. I onboarded as a publishing producer, and at that time, uh, I already discovered that this project, though important to Paradox, was not as important as several of the other projects that were going on. And that also meant that we didn't have as much flexibility in the amount of resources that we could justify spending on this project. And that basically meant that I had to do a lot of it by myself. Um, and I knew that even though I could do a lot of the work that was required, I wasn't going to be able to without having to delay the project significantly. So at this stage, I, I very early on uh, reached out to Godspeed Games and asked them, like, can you help me with, with the QA for this? And at that point, we, we slowly started that. Uh, it was a, a challenge, not necessarily because of the relationship, because, but because this project was in, I think, Unity 3 point something. It was eight years old. We had to get it to Unity 2020 first. That was tricky enough. Then it was three games that were built on a legacy code base that had kept evolving, but for the first game, the original code was no longer uh, available, that sort of thing. So there were a lot of hurdles to get through. Um, and over time, Godspeed Games was able to become experts 
in these games much more than our development team was, uh, than I ever would be. Uh, and in addition to that, they were using some, some skills and expertise that were very beneficial in other ways to me as well. So fortunately for me, Godspeed Games was open to trying uh, more than their original remit uh, and leverage these skills that they were building up anyway to also help me get very creative with other work that needed to get done to be able to get this title out the door. So any, anyone in QA can probably write very uh, accurate step-by-step -step, uh, reproduction steps. They can record footage. They can prepare save games with very specific variables. They can, uh, they are experts at using our cheats to be able to make a specific situation happen. They are great at locating specific content in the game. They knew this story inside out in a way that I never will. So there were a lot of tasks that needed to get done to be able to launch a game. For example, we needed to request age ratings. And when you request age ratings, you have to find very specific content. You have to capture that footage and maybe have a save game ready for the age rating partner to be able to get to that content. So I asked Godspeed to help me with that because these were skills that they had um, in multitudes that I didn't. Uh, in a similar way, our marketing team could also not justify going through 120 hours of content to find specific uh, content in the game, prepare a save game with specific cheats to capture exactly the footage that we needed, screenshots, trailers, etc. So I asked the Godspeed team, to help me prepare those save games. And another one of those examples is uh, because of their expertise with those cheats, they also knew the debug tools very well on the performance side. So there were a lot of things that I needed to test in my milestone reviews to ensure that my development team was delivering as promised with figuring out uh, if the game was actually running at the performance that the dev team had, had indicated, but also whether the functionality of their controller conversion was accurate in the way that they had said that it would be. So in this case, I was able to uh, partner with this team and maximize the expertise that they already had by getting very creative with the ways that I could ask them to support me even more than just in the QA work that they were already doing. So, uh, and in addition to that, it helped me to parallelize work because sure, there was a lot of this work that I would have been able to do but I didn't have the time for it, and I couldn't justify making the time for it either. For this one, I would say you could work with any partner. Um, anyone that you are already looking to engage with is probably uh, an expert in a way that you are not, and they are also building up further expertise in your project in a way uh, that you are not. So there are a lot of uh, benefits that you could reap from this, as long as you get a little creative with the way that you think. So, with that, I will uh, emphasize what I would hope you will take away from this. Uh, for, to be able to figure out how you can leverage external partners, I would suggest that you first start thinking about what it is that is your leverage. What is your vision? What are your goals? What is it that you can uniquely do with your team that drives your ROI? Um, pick your priorities. And from there, create a list of what it is that you shouldn't be doing in-house, that you can't do in-house. Figure out what are your challenges, what are your needs. Don't try to do everything in-house because it's not necessary. And then when you have that list, see that as an opportunity. See that as a chance for you to capitalize on the in-house talent that you have. Generate as much value from those people uh, in a way that feels rewarding to them. Then collaborate with external partners to meet your deadlines, uh, save calendar time, save money, uh, utilize the specific expertise only available elsewhere uh, to reduce risk and multiply your benefit. And then lastly, also reap those long-term benefits. The areas that when you have started working with a partner, you can keep leveraging over time. They're already set up in your partner system uh, with your financial team, um, you know how they communicate, you know what their escalation path is, but also they have a lot of diverse expertise and, and insight and knowledge that you probably don't. And I want, do want to add one disclaimer. 
working with external partners isn't all unicorns and rainbows. Of course, it comes with its own challenges. Of course, you have to learn how to do that. But that would be a different talk. And with that, we move to questions. Hi. So um, what we understand is expanding is a very difficult uh, chasm to cross, and we have to depend on other partners to uh, you know, work with you. How does one build that muscle to you know, trust and work with others? Because you know, there are huge stakes at the, uh, you know, uh, so how, how, how does one can build that muscle and have that trust? Yeah, so what you're asking is like, how do you start building up a relationship? How do you start bridging that chasm? Um, what I've found to be the most successful myself, and I'm sure there are many other ways, but this is what has worked for me, is start small. So the Garage 227 Studios example is one, but to be frank, the one with Godspeed is as well. These are relationships that didn't happen overnight. I've been talking to these teams for five years. Um, for Garage 227 Studios, we started really, really small. We started with, uh, as mentioned, the patch, and from there, you discover that this is a team that, that clicks with you. You can grow that out to be bigger. And with Godspeed Games, we started with QA. I've been doing QA with them for years before I started moving into doing more with them. And hopefully in the future, we'll be doing more, uh, more still now that they are expanding as well. So that has, is what has worked for me. Um, something else, and that applies much more generally, is it helps a lot to teach your team, to stimulate your team to be open-minded, to become lifelong learners with a growth mindset, to have them open up to the fact that they don't know everything, they don't have to know everything, and that asking questions is a good thing. To start by acknowledging that it's okay that you don't have to do everything in-house. And that sounds maybe a little bit vague, but it will feed into that general acknowledgement of, hey, maybe there are other people that can help us with something. So it starts very small within your team, and from there, it can start building out in every relationship that you have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I mean, I, you already touched upon the fact, like, what I'm going to ask, uh, but a lot of times for the indie developers, uh, there is this attachment to the games, what we are building. So there could be a little bit of friction when it comes to outsourcing the work to somebody else because that feeling of we have done it together kind of like goes out. Uh, so how do you like tackle that and what do you have to say on that? Let's see. So what you're asking is uh, your team has attachment to the game that they're making. So what is it that is going to help convince them to work with an external partner and believe that that external partner can be as good as they are, right? Yeah, yeah. So I guess that, again, feeds into what I said about being lifelong learners with a growth mindset. But one of the very tangible things that I would personally do is humanize the teams that you work with. So if you just work with a team that's halfway across the world and you don't introduce people to each other, they're just going to be a screen. They're going to maybe be a little animated video icon on your screen. But there are ways that you can kick, kickstart a relationship uh, by intentionally putting people in the same room and talking about things that are not necessarily directly related to the task at hand. In some cases, you will have the opportunity to go visit that team, especially if it's someone local or it's a larger project. But in the case of smaller teams, you can still do an onboarding activity, a team building activity, do something silly, laugh with each other, discover that you are people, all of you, and that you're all in there to uh, make great player experiences. And from there, build a communication a charter, make a lot of these expectations, working a, or a communication charter, working agreement, there are a lot of terms for it, but make those expectations clear up front make uh, um, agreements around what does it mean to deliver soon? What do uh, good deliveries look like? And keep having those conversations. Keep iterating on that. And the moment that you start building that, um, that rapport, you can point, that, point your team back to that. Like, but they did this for you. They also did this for you. They're now working on such and so. And if you don't have faith that they are capable of doing this right, 
let's open a conversation because that's how we've agreed to collaborate with each other. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for putting together this nice presentation. It was quite interesting. Uh, my question is from the uh, external developer's point of view. Uh, what do an external developer need to do or what skills uh, need to be entailed from becoming, uh, no, from uh, working as a vendor to rather being a development partner? As in, uh, what should a partner do to move away from just being the provider to actually being a long-term partner? Yes. Right. Again, this is going to, your mileage will vary. Different cultures build relationships in very different ways. So the way that I would build up a relationship with a partner from India is going to be very different from the way that I would build up a relationship with a company from the Netherlands. Uh, our expectations about hierarchy, about how direct you can be in your feedback are going to differ a lot. Um, but everything starts with a conversation. Everything starts with trying to, like being open-minded and trying to feel out what it is um, that be, both sides are looking for. Make sure that when you engage in a relationship where you have the intention to make it a long-term partnership, that you choose to invest in that relationship, that putting that relationship first is a priority for you. And that can mean uh, at the beginning, making some more concessions about you, what you are and are not willing to do. Uh, it can also be uh, being very clear and upfront about what your vision for your team is in this, and, and your vision for this relationship is. Um, and of course, again, I can't help but stress enough, like make uh, um, room to have conversations like that. And one of the things that uh, I would say, especially in, in relationships, for example, with some Western European or American teams and Indian teams, like, you guys are allowed to ask. You're allowed to challenge us. We expect you to. We want you to. Um, that's what we are used to. If I enter a new team and I hear some higher up say, this is how we work, and I think that doesn't make sense, or at the very least think that improvement is possible, it is normal in our culture to just go up that, to that person and confront them and ask them about it. So have a good think about what your company culture is, what the culture is of the, the team that you're going to be, that you're interested in working with, and figure out how you can get a little bit closer together. Yeah, you actually, you know, answered my follow-up question, which I was going, you know, coming up with. So vendors, actually, you know, uh, I can understand it's probably, you know, much because of the Indian culture. Vendors are used to follow directions, and they hesitate uh, in, uh, you know, providing feedback to the, you know, to you know, to the team that is actually giving them work, providing feedback, or maybe suggesting better ways to do something. But yeah, I understand. Communication is the key. Yeah. Thank you. I think like one of the examples from the Godspeed Games team here is that I needed them for their expertise. But that's, and that this is how I experienced it, gentlemen. So your, your experience of this from your side may be different, but I am not an expert in QA. So what I needed from this team was to step up and tell me how I needed to do QA. But the starting point of this relationship was that they were expecting me to give them the task of like, this is what needs to be done. And it took a few weeks, a few months of convincing them that I really did want to hear what they had to say because they knew their shit and I didn't. So it took a little while to get to that point where uh, I believe that they felt comfortable enough to actually speak up. Makes sense, thank you. We'll take one last question. Uh, right. Uh, first of all, thank you for mentioning us uh, in your presentation. Uh, so my question is, uh, you were working with uh, us and uh, while working with us uh, or any external partner, so what was your biggest challenge that you uh, faced and how did you overcome that? Um. I'm not sure if off the top of my head, I can think of a biggest challenge. I think the most inspiring challenge for me was and still is finding a way to turn it into a win-win for both sides. 
it's critical for me that I don't just work with a partner that, I, that gets paid for the work that they do. I want them to grow as much as I want my team to grow. And that, as, as I've mentioned, is going to heavily depend on what my partner's vision is, uh, what their goals are, what the goals are for the individuals that I work with. Um, what does success look like for them? Because success, inevitably, like it, it's not just that paycheck that comes into the bank. Success for my external partner looks like something entirely different each and every time, just like it does for all of my teams. And figuring out what a win looks like on both sides, that's always a unique challenge. <laughs>